In this lecture, we're going to be talking about URLs and the encoding of requests. So a URL, as you've probably seen before in typing in your browser, is composed of a number of things. So it is composed of a scheme, a host, a port, a path, a query, and a fragment. So let's take as an example this request right here, or rather this URL right here. And a URL is a uniform resource locator for, for those wondering, uh, but most people call them just URLs. So in this case, we have some example.com requesting a kind of a cat.gif with some width, some height, and then we can pretend for this example that let's say um, we're kind of also requesting that the GIF be played two seconds into uh, its duration. Um, so this first thing here is HTTP. And within the context of a URL, you might have a number of different protocols. So all sorts of protocols use a URL scheme that looks very similar. Um, so we need to just basically specify what is the protocol being used to access this resource. Well, in the case of HTTP, the, the hypertext transport protocol, we're using HTTP as our protocol for accessing the resource. Uh, the next thing is the host. So the host defines where um, this resource is being held. So in this case, we're saying, hey, there's some server out there on the internet um, that we call example.com and it holds this resource. Now, the next thing is the port, and the port is going to be, if we think back to the internet lecture, um, the transport layer basically defines that, hey, a server might have several services, several programs running on it, and each of them might be facilitating different network applications, not all of them, uh, might be speaking HTTP, uh, they might be speak, speaking different uh, application protocols um, on top of there. Um, but in this case, we're looking at port 80, which is the standard HTTP protocol. Alternatively, we might have um, multiple web servers running on the same host. So for instance, we might have a web server running on port 80, another website, or web server rather, on example.com running on port 8080, and we might need to specify different ports for accessing those different web servers. Um, by default, though, a, a, a normal use case within the internet, or within the World Wide Web, rather, rather is uh, port 80, and that can be um, optionally left out, but this is the full URL scheme. So the next thing is the path. So the path identifies the specific resource that we're trying to um, either get or interact with, you know, again, thinking back to get request, post request, the, the resource that we're trying to interact with. So in this case, cat.gif. The next part of the URL scheme is the query. So we might basically be saying, hey, this resource has other um, information that it might need in order to know how to correctly get that resource, or if we're interacting with that resource, how we want to interact with that resource. So for example, we can imagine that this web server is able to facilitate this cat.gif resource, and it might be able to return GIFs of different widths and heights. So in this case, we specify within the query, hey, I want a width of 256 and a height of 256. And again, it's really up to the web application to be uh, how it's going to facilitate these requests, but this is what the standardized URL scheme supports for communication, and this is how uh, things are standardized. Um, so again, this is information that the resource can use for kind of figuring out a little more information about that resource. Um, and then the last thing is the fragment. So the fragment actually isn't sent out in our networked request. It is client-specific information. So um, the, the programs that we're interacting with, so for instance, let's say we're using our web browser to facilitate this request. The web browser might want its own information. So for instance, let's say we pass this link along to someone else, and we're specifically interested in this cat.gif at the two second mark within the GIF, and we don't want them to see the first two seconds, well, we can actually pass along this full URL with client-side information. In this case, we're imagining that our browser is going to be able to um, start playing the cat.gif video at the two second mark. And this fragment component 
allows for a URL to contain client-specific information about the resource that isn't actually passed along to the server. Okay, so let's recall back to the request URI um, from the previous lecture video on RFC 1945. So we have this request line that's composed of our method, our request URI, um, and this HTTP version. So the request URI is a critical component of the URL and kind of gets translated in this request. Um, but there's something to think about here when we're accessing a request. Um, the thing to think about is that what happens if I want to get the hello space world resource? Um, we have a little bit of an issue here, which is that if I was to go and make this request, the server is actually going to inform me that, hey, you made a bad request. And what that means, um, as we saw in the RFC 1945 lecture video, is that you are not actually speaking valid HTTP. The server understands that you're asking for something, um, but it doesn't know what you're speaking because it, it can't properly parse this HTTP request that you've made. You've made a bad request. And the reason for that is these spaces in the request line. So we have method space request URI space HTTP version and then carriage return line feed. These spaces are delimiting the start and the end of the request URI. So when we went and we put a space in there, the server, when it goes to parse this, is going to see, hey, I'm requesting the slash hello resource. And then my HTTP version is world, right, which isn't an HTTP version. And the parsing has gotten out of sync, and it's a, a massive issue. The solution to this problem, however, is uh, encoding. So we need some sort of way of basically saying, I want hello space world, that resource, because for, for whatever reason, you know, we might imagine that we need our web application to facil facilitate web resources that have a space in it. There's no reason to leave them out, that that shouldn't be possible. Though, I mean, in, I guess in theory, you could imagine a protocol where you just aren't allowed to have resources with spaces in them. But fortunately, HTTP allows for uh, resources with spaces in them. URLs can have spaces in them. They just must be encoded. So there are a number of unsafe characters, which includes, for instance, that space, and it's unsafe, as we saw, because when we go to parse that request, uh, it's going to throw off the parser. I mean, in theory, you could write a parser that could deal with it, but we want things to be very simple, quick, and we have defined in the standard that the space character is unsafe and must be encoded. Um, there's also some reserved characters that must be encoded, and then there's also unprintable characters that must be encoded. So, for example, if our resource had a new line character in it, how would we represent that in the URL? Um, I mean, I guess you could imagine having, you know, this URL written out and then like a new line in it and it goes to a second line. It'd be a little strange looking, a little confusing. Um, it could work, but according to the standard, those are unprintable characters and they must be encoded. Um, optionally, though, all characters may be encoded. So if you want to encode, let's say, in A, um, you're free to do so, it's just not a requirement that it be encoded. So what do these encodings look like then? Well, the way that these uh, characters are encoded is that we have a percent sign followed by a hex character followed by a hex character. So we're going off of the ASCII chart here on the right for determining what those hex character values are. And if we look here at space, um, in, let's see here, where is the space character? In the top row, uh, second column, we have our, or third column rather, we have the space character and its hex value in ASCII is two zero. So the way that we URL encode that character is that we say it is percent two zero. Alternatively, pound is percent two three, slash is percent two F, question mark is percent three F. And again, we can optionally choose to encode any of the characters using this URL encoding scheme. We can do percent four one for capital A. So then now let's see what that looks like when we make a correctly formed request for the hello space world resource. Um, instead of putting a space there, we put that percent two zero. We've correctly URL encoded our request 
And now the web server is happy with us and is happy to return to us the hello space world resource. Okay, so there are a number of encoding methods. So we were looking there at the URL encoding, uh, but there is a number of content types for servicing requests, especially in the context of, let's say, posting data. So we saw earlier in a previous lecture video that we might want to have some form on our website in which we're specifying, hey, my name is Connor, and I want to post the fact that my name is Connor to the greet resource. This is kind of what this request here is specifying. So in this case, we declare to the web server, hey, we're using a content type of application x www form URL encoded. And what that means and what that structure looks like is that we can have a number of fields um, where each field is represented with um, its key, so in this case name, and then its value, in this case Connor. And they are uh, separated with an equal sign. We could also have more um, values in there, and those other values would be separated with an ampersand. Okay, alternatively though, we don't have to just use a uh, form URL encoded content type. We can also use a JSON uh, encoded content type for speaking to it, and there are reasons why you might choose one over the other. Um, in this case, JSON is JavaScript uh, object notation. So this allows us to send kind of slightly more structured data at a server. And in this case, it looks something like this, where we have some curly braces, we specify our key um, within quotes, and then we say that we have this string object Connor um, after a colon, and this is the structure of JSON. Um, the use cases for both vary, um, it's up to the web application for what kinds of content types it's going to be looking for. So some might have, for example, that form URL encoded as a result of the fact that you're interacting with a form on a web page and you go and let's say click some submit button. So you can imagine a form where you're asked to type in your name and then you hit submit and it posts as a form URL encoded content type to the server and the server is looking for that content type and is going to go through and understand that. On the other hand, you might have um, more hierarchical data that the server wants to be able to handle and we might be building up these complex objects that we want to send to the server and you might choose to use application JSON. So one common paradigm within the World Wide Web, within the web, is um, JSON RESTful APIs, you might have heard of that. Uh, and what that is, is these programming layer basically of, I want to interact with this remote server and I want to start making requests that we don't necessarily care about HTML. We don't care about these web pages. We just want to be doing kind of remote computation. We want to be making these API requests out to the server, getting H API responses back that we can do on top of HTTP. And oftentimes they might use the JSON content type for doing that. That's kind of why that exists. It's a very common scheme to basically be pushing data with JSON. The server can very quickly parse this complex hierarchical structure and then re return complex results that aren't HTTP, that aren't meant to be viewed in the browser, uh, or rather HTML, that aren't meant to be viewed in the browser, but are instead just blobs of data that have structure to them. And that's why you might use the JSON uh, content type. 